those of the individual co-hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the firearms radio network and or their employers. Your discretion is advised. This is especially true on live shows. Uh, I got a couple giveaways that we're going to be announcing tonight. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned throughout the show to find out how to get some bonus entries in our monthly giveaway. Um, this month, we're going to be giving away some after action project swag. I'm uh, going to give away some swag from Sentinel Concepts um, on, uh, you know, we're going to take care of that, get you guys some swag sent over from Sentinel Concepts, uh, maybe a book from our book of the month club. And um, if you like what we're doing and would like to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash after action project. Your hosts include myself, Jeremy Gill, Andy Montoya, Judson Crossland, and Tim Heron of TimHeronShooting.com. That's enough Thanks about us. Yes, yes. Big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, you know, uh, so let's let's get into what everybody's here to talk about tonight. That's uh, going to be 1911s and red dots. Uh, hold on, hold on. We, we got to get back into the conversation. What was that, Steve? What did, what does Tim look like in heels again? What was that? <laughs> Something about like a fourteen-year-old cross-dressing transgender. Yeah, fourteen-year-old girl with an oh. ass with an ass that would break your heart. That you can bounce a quarter yeah. off of. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Hey, uh, that means it needs to be used more than. <laughs> <laughs> Every day is squat day for Tim. Have you seen how tall he is? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hey Tim, what are you drinking tonight? I saw you put a bottle to your lips. Oh, this is White uh, Claw. Oh God. <laughs> I am not Jack Clemens. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's a uh, Boulevard Unfiltered Wheat. So this is like my favorite beer from back home in Kansas City. Nice. So. I picked up a, a six pack of our local hazy IPA. Which is I had one of, I had one of those uh, last night. It's pretty oh, good nice. stuff. It's very fruity. Nice. Just like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in between shit talking, we're going to be talking about Steve's uh, handgun employment course. Um, it used to it used to offer essential handgun employment and critical handgun employment. We're going to talk about how um, those those courses have kind of come to be married into one. Um, his student is Bell. She's an IDPA shooter. Uh, she spends most of her time teaching and running a range. Um, in her local neck of the woods, uh, Tim Heron shooting, uh, Tim Heron of Tim Heron shootings. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, and for whatever reason, I always got scared and nervous in front of, uh, some of you greats. And, uh, uh, so, Hey, um, so let's talk a little bit, uh, Steve, most of our listeners probably know who you are and the great things that you've done. Um, well, there's only two of them on, the, on there. Actually, we got, got quite a few. Um, but why don't you talk to us a little bit about what you would like to be remembered for um, with regards Ooh. to the firearms training industry, and maybe something that uh, that most gun folks don't know about you. Mm. What would I most like to be remembered for? I'd rather be forgotten for a lot of things than remembered. Um, I would probably say, honestly, um, I mean, everybody says, you know, some type of, you know, you know, making people better, making people this. I would rather have them or have to be remembered for the outside of the box thinking on the, you know, the normal, the, the, well, I guess we would consider the normal or the dogmatic approaches to shooting a gun. I'd like to be more remembered about taking it and simplifying it. I like it because it's really not new. It's just something most people haven't seen or done because they're stuck in a rut. No, I love it. Um, Bill, before we get into the show, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, um, your shooting background, and, and how you ended up in Steve's class? Um, well, I actually uh, Trunk ended of a up car. In, Yeah. <laughs> I, I was taken hostage. Um, they forced me. No, uh, I was over in South Carolina for my oldest son was graduating from basic training for the Army. And since uh, Steve happened to be over there, I asked if he could squeeze me into his class. And he was so gracious to do so. I'm normally all the way on the other side of the country in Washington State. I work for the Firearms Academy of Seattle, the operations manager there, and one of the lead instructors. And uh, Steve had been out there and basically put me through a private version of the handgun class. And then I got to take the actual version and got to see him in front of a whole group of students and is surprisingly well behaved. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> 
<laughs> nice. I only made one person cry. <laughs> yeah, that one guy. Uh, the skinny kid. drummer kid. <laughs> <laughs> Leave Jensen with the holes in his t-shirt. <laughs> um, so you used to offer essential handgun employment and critical handgun employment yeah. before we went live. You were talking about how you've you've married those two courses in one. Uh, talk to us a little bit about why you decided to go that route and and what has changed from the student's perspective um, since you've done that. So the, I'll, I'll be brutally honest because people suck at shooting a gun and everybody's ego wants them to jump. Well, I've taken so and so's this class and this class and this class. Well, that's cool, bro. You check the box. Um, with your favorite instructor or whatever it is you've done, and that's great. Uh, can you actually shoot? <laughs> can you actually perform to some set of standards? Uh, you know, while there's people that can, a vast majority could not. And when you're turning a quote unquote critical skills class, which involved, you know, day one, honestly, it was, it was, it was a half day diagnostic to shooting. Let's just make sure everybody's on the same page with their shooting ability, their skill sets, how they work the gun, because you don't know half these people. You know, some I know, some I don't. Um, and then, hey, we're going to be doing one-handed shooting, one-handed manipulations, one-handed malfunction clearances. We're going to be shooting on the move. We're going to be doing off-axis positions, unconventional shooting positions, movement, da 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 Oh, boy. And then it's like all we did was add in, like, some movement, dude, and you can't hit, you know. So, And it made me reset, rethink some things that, you know, over 20-plus years of doing this, you, you see this. There, there's this evolution. There's a cycle of it. And I went back through the notes and went back through my data points from the from the year classes and previous years. I went, you know what? It's still just shooting a gun. But if they can't shoot a gun, they can't do anything else. And honestly, there's nothing to it other than shooting a pistol, right? It's just shooting a gun. No matter what you add into the equation, it's just shooting a fucking gun. Agreed. Stop worrying about all the other stuff, man. It, it, hey, bro, it's you grab the gun, you press the trigger straight back to the rear, you're done. That's it. It's simple. But once you added in complexities and other tasks, people lost their mind. And then I went back through a whole bunch of stuff. I'm like, yeah, you're going to get what you get. You show up. I'm going to make you better. I'm going to give you things to think about. I'm giving you my practice sessions. I'm giving you the things that I like to do, my exercises, my drills, ones that I've stolen from other people through the history of my shooting career. And I put it all together in a different format because that's what you do. It's a chocolate chip cookie recipe. Right. Because no matter what you put in it, it's still just flour, eggs, water, some stuff and some chocolate chips. And you've got a recipe. And doing so, I was like, I can always uptick the course if I need to. If I've got rock stars, I'll uptick it a little bit. But that hasn't happened yet. So it came down to I'm going to give you everything that you need, whether you like it or not. That's why you're here. And you're going to be better by the time you leave the class. And I'm going to run you to a certain degree of performance to get you where you need to be based on your actions, the things you <clears throat> talked about in the morning briefs, so on and so forth. While I reviewed my entire curriculums over the year, like any good instructor does, I, I, I revamped things continually through the year and no class is ever the same. Tim will attest to this. You have bullet points, you get to certain things and you see the opening volley of shots and you go, okay, cool, this is a gun, <laughs> grip it this way. <laughs> right. And, and Tim and Bell both, and you guys will know this. So, and then I really started breaking down everything going, well, I need to teach people how to shoot in low light because that's, that's important. I need to teach people how to shoot on the move. And I need to teach people how to shoot period. So I have a, a course that's basically essential, you know, the handgun employment and carbine employment. I do a handgun carbine shooting on the move two day package. And then I do a low light block. Welcome to life. Those are all the things you need to know how to do. And once you've got that, starting with this without doing this hey bro everything else is easy that's everything you have done as a human being your entire life you're walking you're running your movement everything you do naturally now add pistol iq drops 80 points but i need to kick those up another 20 to 40 points to get you back to some level of proficiency and that's the truth there is nothing you do with this thing that you do not do in your daily life that you have not done your entire life and the silly thing is is listening to like so much noise and chatter like on the internet everybody oh. everybody wants to make pistol shooting out to be like you have to have like four doctorate degrees in order to be good with a pistol i mean and steve and i have this conversation literally almost <laughs> daily I mean, literally either i call him or he calls me and it's just like just grip the fucking gun and see the sights bro that's it that's yeah, it shoot the gun touch yeah. the press roll man touch the trigger press the trigger roll trigger press just shoot the gun. Bell was in the truck. We were going to dinner that night when I called you on that rant, Tim. 
and she was dying in the corner. She was like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, if, "If I don't, if I don't push every one of these people into a burlap bag and throw them in the river with a cinder block in it like kittens, it'll be a miracle." Hey, Steve, let but, me but ask you. Let me ask you a question on that. So, um, I myself, I for a, for a long time, I've shot for a long time, whatever, blah blah blah. Um, and I shot pretty decent. And then all of a sudden I started regressing back to like the old ways. What causes a regression in a, in an experienced shooter? Laziness for one, it's just lazy and it's redundancy. You're doing the same things over and over again to a point of boredom. So would you say it's it, something it, it, along the lines of complacency where we don't yeah. really respect the, the art, the yes. sport, the, whatever you want to call the gun world that yeah. we live in? Okay. Yeah, a a absolutely. It is. It, it's it's one hundred percent complacency. I'm good. I can do this. Well, that's because it's, it's like let's just take an example. Dot torture. Mm hmm. Favorite favorite drill. Well, right. After okay, a while, got it. After a while, you're just going through the motions, and it's just ballistic masturbation, right? Well, see, I I yeah. feel like yeah. dot, I mean, let's let's talk about it then. I feel like dot torture yeah. is a good drill to see where people are right now. And, 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 I mean, you can change my mind. I mean, I'm not I'm not one of those guys that is going to be hardcore on one particular thing or sure. drill or whatnot. I mean, tell me tell me I'm wrong. No, I would agree. Dr. Torture is a good it's a good, you know, 20 round, 25 round assessment of somebody's current level of skill. OK, unfortunately, what? there's not enough repetition within dot torture to see trends in a shooter's performance, though. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's used, it's used too much too often instead of what it was originally designed for. That is a cold drill once every 30 days. Okay. Realistically, it is a cold every 30 day. I'm going to step up on the line and realistically, I, I have cleaned that at like seven yards. My best ever was a seven yard clean of it. I'm like, okay, that's realistic for, and that's everything inside the lines, not cutting lines because I don't count lines. So, and that was, and it was a lot of this. It was a lot of, Oh man! Oh, don't get out! Don't get out! Don't move the gun! Don't move the gun! I mean, and while there's a proficiency that comes with it, it should be done as a cold performance drill every thirty days. Okay, let's call it every thirty, just to say so. So, but people shoot it religiously as like this gospel, like they do B8s. So let me ask you this: the 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 only time, not the only time, but you know, mostly the only time I use dot therapy, and I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. We can end sure. it, but is I do a three day um, emergency response training with, you know, mm -hmm. church security detail, teachers, you know, whatever, mull, anything. And the first drill I do on the live portion is dot therapy so that I can see kind of where their patterns are and where I need to go from there. Is that something that you would find acceptable? Yeah, ab absolutely. What it's a very <laughs> good baseline proficiency, you know, and here's the thing with it. It's easy to mess that drill up because it's three yards, right? Right. And where people mess it up is they look past the sights. Mm -hmm. They lose their focus. They lose their concentration on that small circle because they concentrate on the number in the bullet holes instead of the important things, which is the thing in the front of the gun. Okay. Yeah. So everybody's looking right now. This is this is my teaching folder. So as you open this up, yeah. it's six Three circle. Six six dots, two inch circles. I don't do a dot torture, so we're not doing like one-handed manipulate, you know, one-handed or reload manipulation things like that. Um, I'm I'm utilizing it more for like uh, Frank Gar Frank Garcia's dot drill um, sure. that uh, that Frank kind of designed back in the day. But where Frank's drill is done at seven yards and it's done on a five-second par time, you know, a draw mm -hmm. and fire six rounds into one individual circle, and you do that six strings of six shots. Um, sure. I do it at three. And I do the first three dots with absolutely no par time on it whatsoever. And the reason I do it at three yards is exactly what Steve's talking about. So it's very, very easy, so easy to think about a result and not stay focused on the process. And the process is, of course, sight alignment and pressing the trigger without disturbing that sight, man, you know, just managing the sights. That's it. And everybody will go one, two, three four and then they start looking over the gun and just watching holes appear and they immediately start thinking about like oh wow man i'm doing so good bang you know and then they drop one Gone. out and it's like yep you're done you know and it's it, it's so it's and you it's, see it happen oh absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely right there, like, i'm like that dude is about to shake this shot <laughs> goodbye seismic so 
Um, I, and that's, I prefer Judson to kind of answer your question on that. Like I prefer actually you utilizing just a sheet of dots like that and, and yeah. staying kind of steering clear of like a, an actual traditional dot torture where you're doing one handed and, you know, and strong hand a weekend and reloads and things and just making them basically shoot an untimed group, you know, session of groups yeah. for three strings and then putting the time component on it and yeah. putting the time component on it. People are like, Oh man, I nailed this shit. And then the next mm -hmm. three strings, they're doing a five second time component and they fall to pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't put a time component on mine when I'm assessing their initial right skills of i mean i just want to see sure where the pattern lands you know eight to ten shots yeah. per dot and i use a similar piece of paper like you do and i also mm -hmm. use a you know a two by two piece of cardboard that i have a template and i'll just spray paint you know dots on it but yeah um andy i i think you had a follow-up that you wanted to ask well no i was really we um i think we covered the dot torture pretty good and i think that was a great question um Tim, Tim's gotten me a couple times already with, uh, you know, <laughs> focusing on the result, you know, and not the action. So um, let's get back to the the course, though. Um, give us the breakdown. If you were going to kind of tell me off the website, Steve, what's required of your class? How many rounds? What are you looking for? Do you want a red hat like Masada Ayub's AIs? What, what are you looking for? <laughs> Fuck no. Um, so, so what I ask for people to do is show up with a, at least a degree of proficiency with a gun, understanding the gun, you know, manipulations. Like this isn't a course for, I mean, it is technically because I've had those people show up. It's like, I've got a gun. It's out of the box. I took a CCW class somewhere. What do I do with it now? Is it loaded? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I see, oh, we've seen that. Trust me. And I'm the, so, so thankful you let me in your class. It, I appreciate that. Just despite all that. You're, <laughs> You're welcome. You did, you, did, you did wonderful. We stopped loading your hair into the gun. Yeah. Um, when you loaded your braid into the magwell, that was amazing. The So the thing is, you know, come up with a good mindset. You know, have a willingness to learn. Take notes. Ask questions. Um, have a baseline level of, I understand the gun. I understand being safe. The usual BS. Pay attention in the morning brief when we're discussing. We, we, do, a, we do about an hour-long roundtable in the morning. Uh, set everybody down. Get everybody comfortable. Get rid of the morning jitters talk to people, find out previous training history, why they're there, what they are here to learn. That, that is the important thing to me. It's like, what, like I have baseline, I have my, my mind of where I want to take students, but ultimately it's their class. So I want to know what they're after and where their mind is on that. Um, so we get through that and if they pay attention and they listen to what I'm telling them in the morning brief, they have all the answers to be successful. Everything that they need to be successful throughout the next two days, three days, whatever it is, was given to them in that first hour of talk time and writing notes and whiteboarded. I have given them all the keys to being successful and I have set them up for success right out the gate. Unfortunately, it's right over the head most of the time. Um, Did you say waterboarded? I'm sorry, what'd you say? Yes, yes, waterboarding, definitely. Whiteboarding, yeah, waterboarding, same guess. I'm not. These are coffee. I'm, I'm good. I'm good with it. Monsters generally in the morning. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about that. And from there, you know, hey, if you show up with about 800 rounds for the two days, you're doing pretty good based on the size of the classes. Um, if it's a little bit lighter class, like the one we had in South Carolina was awesome. We had like 10 shooters, 11 shooters. That made life so much better. Cause I, I, I literally sent out a class email like, hey, y'all are gonna shoot a lot more, like bring more ammo because I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna run one line and I'm gonna drive you based on what I saw from the registrations and some of the people that were there. So I was able to uptick it just a little bit on the pure volume, but not just wasting ammo. Um, every round was very purposeful throughout every exercise. There, there's no ballistic masturbation. I just don't have guys to shoot to shoot, and I, and I don't puppy mill it. We're not moving along until everybody is, is within a proficiency level to move along. And because I don't want to lose anybody. I don't want to leave anybody behind in particular, but I'm also not going to stagnate the entire class. So uh, I have a I have a follow up for both Scott and um, Ambell. So when you say you, you're not just wasting ammo, I took a class in- Wait, who's, who's Scott? I'm sorry. Me. I'm um, Steve. I'm Steve. <laughs> I, actually have another, I actually have another friend of mine that's named Scott Fisher, and I, I actually had to mail him a bunch of program materials for the an NRA class that I was doing at a, at a shooting range. I actually mailed the program materials to Steve Fisher. And not I didn't get him. 
<laughs> so anyway, good news, Steve. You'll have your NRA credentials pretty soon, man. Yeah, no, right. Right. <laughs> Again, so great. We, we were talking about not just wasting <laughs> ammo. I took a class in Ohio three or four years ago. It was a three day, yeah, three day class, and we went through about a. I, I think I shot twelve hundred rounds in three days, which is not. I mean, it's, that's a lot, but one one full day wasn't even on the range, so it was really twelve hundred rounds in two days, mm. and I felt like a lot of it was just. Wasted. pulling the trigger so bell i'll start with you first and then steve if you can follow up bell what what type of um concept or drills or, or whatnot are in the class that don't just quote unquote spray and pray oh well perfect i can tell you my absolute favorite steve drill that i steal all the time um and i i love i think it's outstanding i know he uses it in his own practice and he used it in the class and that's his uh load one shoot two <laughs> and that second Mommy. one tells me a lot <laughs> uh and running that drill m generates immediate improvement i've tried it on my own students since he introduced me to it and they all just love the shit out of it and they see an immediate improvement. Okay, Bell, can you please tell us more about what that drill is? Tell me, tell me the like from from you know shooter ready. You're, you're gonna make me explain Steve's drill while he's listening. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a test just to make sure you were paying attention in class. Yeah. She wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was one of the people not taking notes in the morning. I was one of the ones nap. Um no, the load one, shoot two, it, you know, it gives you basic manipulations and it gives you that concentration on trigger control. It's, uh, you know, you load the gun, eject the mag, put it in your pocket, holster the gun, draw and fire two shots. Well, when that second one goes click, uh, what that gun does or does not do really gets you concentrating a lot more on your grip and on your trigger press. Okay, so now that brings up another question that I have to ask. And then we'll go over to Steve. You said eject the mag and put it in your pocket. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me as a defensive pistol shooter. Wouldn't you just eject the mag, grab your new one and reload, let the mag drop to the ground? So the way the drill is set up, it's it's a diagnostic performance drill. Um, I learned it 20 odd years ago from somebody else. Okay. So basically I take the pistol, get the shooter set up. They'll take the gun, load the gun, chamber the round, remove the magazine, stow the magazine. Okay. Holster the gun on whatever signal we use, draw, present, fire, get a live shot, gun recoils, and as soon as the dot lands or the sight picture is relevant, press the trigger again immediately without re-verifying, right? Let the gun fall back to a natural point of aim, so to speak, and press the second shot off immediately without a reset, ride, run, hold gun, uh, ease forward into the headache mode of resetting, re-verifying, and pressing. Okay. So what I'm basically doing is I'm creating a one I can see manipulations. Um, it's one magazine. Okay. So 15 rounds in the, you know, 15 rounds total, 12, whatever it is you have, I don't care. Um, this way I get people a seeing what they need to see that is relevant. And what really happens is they kind of ignore the reset part and they just shoot the gun. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. Hey, as soon as your sights or your dot is relevant to the size of the target, we are shooting at the distance, press the trigger immediately. That's all I want you to do. I just want you to see the site, track the site, track the dot, whatever it is, it's rising and falling, press the damn trigger immediately. Stop riding it through the reset motion. Let the gun recoil, come off the trigger, gun falls back, touch the trigger, press it. Done. And what it does, it gives you a good live fire so we can control the recoil and pause, see what the gun is doing. As the gun settles, press the trigger for the next shot immediately and then do this and shove the gun forward three and a half feet to the target, bombing <laughs> projectiles that aren't no longer in the gun. They're like, oh. I did that, didn't I? Yeah, you, you, you did yep. that, hero. You, you you did that. So don't do that. Well, how do I stop it? You don't do it. What's well, interesting is it's not even the you know the ball and dummy. You don't know when the dummy's coming. That that you yeah. literally know the second shot's coming, and you can still. It seems like you're still gonna. Yeah, choke. and you know the second shot is dry. The second. Well, if you don't it, cheat the drill and you shoot, you pull the trigger again as soon as the sights are relevant, and you don't cheat it you get the feedback that he's trying to make them see. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I've tried running that drill, but I, for whatever reason, I, I always mess it up. It takes me like two or three attempts to to set the gun up correctly. It's super simple to do, <laughs> right? But for whatever reason, it's I get two bangs, and I'm like, so I've given I'm, up I'm, on yeah, it. I, hey, Jeremy, I think the first thing you set the gun up is actually clean it. Hey, I don't mm -hmm. why I don't need to clean guns. Is that a thing? <laughs> Just buy a new one. Yes, right? I guess. Actually, I don't know why people I don't clean guns. It's way overrated. You guys yeah, are way over taking that process of cleaning guns. Or just get another one. It's fine. I clean a gun, my gun yeah. so often that anytime I go to clean my gun, I have to go buy new cleaning stuff because I don't know where it's at. <laughs> hey, there's this cool thing. There's this cool thing called brake cleaner, non chlorinated <laughs> brake cleaner. Right. Walmart, three dollars a can. I'm done. It takes me three minutes to clean a pistol and a carbine. But no, I'll so that, that's one of the main anything. drills. Oh, oh, you should just bring bring your all your cleaning stuff. You'll need it. But <laughs> but that's one of the main things, and that's that's one of the opening volley drills. That that's one of the first diagnostic shooting performance drills that I will do with shooters. Everybody wants to know about gear. Bell, what um what gear did you bring? What what gun were you running? Um, how many mags did you have? Uh, um, and all that good stuff. Um, well, actually, uh, for that particular trip, I was not able to bring any of my own gear because the amount of time I was spending on base. Um, so I don't know what the hell I was shooting. Some Nighthawk thing. Yeah, baby. Steve a Nighthawk thing? <laughs> so, so I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It's, 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 it's Belle. Yeah, she had uh, one of my double stack government gun GRPs with a uh, Hollow Sun 507 on it. Um, about seven or eight mags, a bunch of 147 ball. And how much different was it than iron sights? Um, not really that different at all, except for I still wanted to try and look at the sights through the window. The, other than that, everything else is the same. Yeah. More, more than likely, if you're trying to look at the sights through the window or look at the dot through the window, that means you're also probably over refining your iron sight picture too much too. Which, yes, exactly. <laughs> which which we've talked about pretty which, religiously. So I'm yes, trying to get into a sniper which rifle. Which is one of my not. big problems and why I'm so slow. <laughs> I just don't use my sight. Slow. She, she's not yeah, yeah well, slow, the rest of the she's... time I'm not using them. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I just, did, I just did some Rob Pinkus combat focus shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. You're using some combat focus right focus. There. The trick, though, the Sound trick there is bigger targets. Yeah. <laughs> No, you just move and go. And then complain about anything that's not an Infinity Arms pistol. <laughs> oh, is that still a project? It's not real. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 yes. Look, even Hudson, even Hudson no. beat him to the market and <laughs> got out of the market all in that time frame. I mean, come on. Nice. I want to. Um, I saw. Speaking of gear, I saw something um, the other day, and it was it was common on on some on some social media, um, but it was a guy that took your RDS pistol course, I believe, I don't know if that's the, the correct name for that course, but um, didn't own a red dot gun, right? Showed up, um, you have a ton of loaner guns. Um, so what does a student, if I wanted to take one of your classes, what do I have to have to, to show up to take one of your classes? Money. A handgun Money. and some magazines. Money. <laughs> what if, Money. Even if I didn't have a handgun. Money. Um, if you didn't have a handgun and you're like, hey man, I want to do this, I want to try this with this gun or that gun or red dot sighted pistol, Glock 17, I only carry that, whatever, I don't care. Yeah, I have guns available. Um, bring quality ammo, you, you know, and shoot the gun. I don't care. I, I have guns for a purpose or designed to be used. If you want to use one, by all means, hit me up in an email and say, hey, Steve, I just really like to shoot. brave enough to ask him. <laughs> Yeah, which I don't get. People are like, can I borrow? I'm like, no, in the email. And I'm like, no, I'm kidding. Yes, you can. I'm like, that's okay. You, you want to shoot a Nighthawk? You, you can shoot one of my Nighthawks. You, you want to shoot a Chambers gun? You want to shoot an Agency Glock? You want to shoot a Stock Glock? You want to shoot a 509? You want to shoot a CZ? Dude, I've got I've got a bazillion guns in the safe. What What do you want? You can shoot one. I don't care. Just ask me. I'll bring you a holster. Your right hand and left hand. You want a Pentax strong side? I have holsters for all. I don't believe tell. you when you say you've got a bajillion guns in your safe. <laughs> <laughs> That's because Tim saw a picture of partial one night. I called him. I said, "Hey, Tim." He's like, "Yeah, man. I like. I'm having a really bad day. What's wrong?" Yeah. And I panned across the eight foot whiteboard of guns. He's like, "I, I really hate you right now." I, 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 almost, I, I, I almost crashed my car. <laughs> Because like, I was like, oh Bren my tens? God. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, those are those are Bren tens in the middle. That's a that's a pair of Bren tens. Yeah, it is. You know, you know, uh, Tim shares his guns too. I uh he doesn't have a bazillion, but uh, I was on the range with him one time and there's a student that said, Man, that's a cool gun. And Tim, you want to tell him what happened? I mean, it was pretty, pretty nice of you to <laughs> loan that, that <laughs> gun. Awesome. 
Oh my god. <laughs> so so yeah, these these characters asked me if I wanted to like, you know, kind of help out with a with one of their CCW classes kind of like as an adjunct instructor. And I was like, yeah, I'd, be, I'd love to. So came out and I'm helping out the range. And of course I've got my gun just, you know, it's running a cold range. So I got my gun cold in the holster. And this guy walks over and he was like, dad, man, is that, you know, that's a full custom 1911. And I'm like, yeah, it is. And the guy's like, oh man, that's awesome. Literally reaches, <laughs> reaches and grabs my pistol and just draws <laughs> it right out of the holster in front of me. And I'm like, what the fuck is, I mean, I'm like, huh. it's like a draw. Oh, dude. That's I just, how you get shot. Oh, I just, but yeah, fortunately, obviously, the, I knew the gun was unloaded. I was like, oh, cool. He's going to like touch the grips or something, you know? No, this dude just like straight up grabs the grips of the gun, yanks the gun out of the holster. He's like, oh, man, that's freaking cool. And I'm like, holy shit, dude. You know, you know, I reach in both hands and I, you know, grab his arm, his hands, and, you know, control the gun. And I'm like, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's put that back in the holster here. And he's like, oh, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, no, like, oh shit, sorry, man. Thank anything. It was just like, oh yeah, that's really cool. Hey, man, thanks. And it just just gets in his car and takes off. And I'm like, oh my god, these dudes are not going to believe him when I tell them. That's, that, how, that's just, how you get shot. What just happened? <laughs> yeah, I was I was there that day, and Ooh. I think everybody's eyes on the range that were within sight of you, their eyes were like. Oh, at first, I literally turned around to look at Andy. I was like, you like a fucker. Did you put this guy up to this? You know, like I was thinking like Andy was like, hey, go over there and just take that gun out of Tim's holster. And, and I turn around to look at Andy and Andy's just looking at me and he's like, what? And I tell Andy that and Andy's like, are you kidding me? And, he gets, and I'm like, you didn't, wow. you didn't set this. You did. Holy shit. Who was that guy? And why the hell did he grab that gun out of my holster? <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> Steve! What the moral of the story is is Tim would have been dead in the streets. <laughs> we would have had 1911 with yeah with his own 1911. <laughs> Jeez. It only has to work once. <laughs> <laughs> it's Albuquerque. What you, you should have known Fact. better. Yeah. Um, speaking of students, Bill, talk to us a little bit about the the makeup of the student body in that class. What it what did it look like? Were they all? Um, you know, tactical Timmies, were they, you know, middle of the gun road guys that they were looking to improve their skills? Who, who's taking this class with you? Um, well, there was, uh, there was a couple of just run of the mill average dudes. There was a couple of guys that are quote unquote industry influencers, podcasters, uh, two A advocates. Uh, there was a, uh, a kid from the military that was a really good shooter, and um, there was a there was a guy that was just outstanding USPSA shooter instructor that was uh, hands down top of the class, uh, and one putts. So, oh, mm -hmm. I like it. yeah. There's always a putt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the guy, the, the dude who's on fire, um, he's an instructor at the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, um, former Marine or whatever they are, um, former cop, really good dude, squared away, great shooter, really good instructor, just a super good dude. He's like he's like the guy you want to have like 20 of them in class. I just, just talked awesome to dude. him today, actually. I, I touched base with him and uh, his wife, Kim, went and shot that GSSF match and, and had a good. blast. Uh, he his, brought his, his wife, wife was out. Great. <laughs> she was a kick. <laughs> she, she was a Brit to boot, so I had all the British jokes and that was great. You know, like we can load you a gun. I'm sure you only drop it once. Um, It'll be fine. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, she had no problems whatsoever playing the dozens with Steve. So she was, it was, good. She was a good guy. She was awesome. If you're Steve, gonna, is it, is, it, is it someone I know? You said a USPSA guy. You might. He, just, he shoots some USPSA and three gun, if I remember okay. correctly. Um, I think his last name is White. Correct. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, okay. really good dude. David, David White. Dave White? Yeah, I, I, really that good name dude. Does sound really, You said he teaches at Fletzy? Yeah, South. Okay. Yeah, really solid guy. Great dude. And, and, you know, his thing, he was there to learn. Like, I do, well, I'll let Bell talk about it, but whatever. Go ahead, Bell. Well, uh, no, he, uh, he had said that he was there, like, to, to get a good, like, brush up and, and get tuned up. And he was really engaged and super helpful to other students. Um, uh, I'm always excited to meet other people that are motivated about reaching people and improving people and and he definitely expressed that that was part of his goals as an instructor 
he, he wanted to see how, you know, materials presented, different material, things you can take back. And, 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 you know, we had this discussion. That's what I do when I go to courses anymore, because let's be real. There's only so many ways to shoot a chest box. There's only so many ways to shoot a head box. There's only so many ways to shoot a gun left-handed, right-handed, whatever. Um, there, obviously, there's micro tweaks to that based on experiences. But he's like, you know, realistically, he goes, you know, I'm here just to, you know, get on the line, shoot a gun, because I don't get enough time to do that, honestly, and to basically, you know, look at things to pick and steal, which he did. He's like, hey, man, I'm, I'm taking this drill. I'm taking this exercise. These are these are very relevant to what we're doing and what we want. I'm like, hey, man, this shit's free, dude. You, you paid for it. But this is nothing new. It's just a way of presenting the information that makes sense to other people. Um, people as a whole, especially instructors, and I'll use the term real fucking loosely, um, because there's so many parrots out there that are ridiculous. Um, this is why rainforests are dying. Um, <laughs> that, that the problem becomes they really don't know what they're saying. They, 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 they do this shit and, and they use these super huge cool kid words and all this stuff. I'm like going, that doesn't even mean that in context, but that's cool, bro. You just do you to sound smarter. And it's stupid. Just say what you mean, stupid. You don't have to sit there and try to sound smarter than every other kid in the bookstore because you're not. Stop it. The, the days of Travis Haley's doing that shit is over. I mean, stop it. It doesn't Ugly. need to be like, hey, man, my, my grip is this, and I'm using this, this, and this, and this motion. I'm like, oh, you mean you just want me to put both hands on the gun? Yeah, cool. I got it. Yeah. He's charging an extra 100 bucks, though, so if you use the big words. It is so ignorant. It makes you sound more stupid. Yep. It makes you sound stupider. The yeah. more you simplify it, the better they're able to retain it and perform it. And we Amen, see that all the time. Sister. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. 100%. You will lose more people with big words and terminology. And when your students are sitting there Googling the words and looking up the sources to figure this shit out, they're not learning. Taking away from, they're, they're not learning. You're going to shut people down trying to prove that you're a bigger brain in the room. And you're not that bigger of a brain, dude. Stop yeah. or do that or whoever it is that's doing it. It's bullshit. I agree. I was it in drives a, me nuts. We took a medical class one time, and uh, that was one of my feedbacks Ooh. because they were using really, really big medical terms. And I'm like, you know, for the average person, we're not going to remember any of these medical terms. Keep it simple for us, and um, yeah. that that way I can I can remember it. Otherwise, I ain't gonna remember shit. You know, I just yeah. my my brain is too too slow to to remember big words. I guess, but lizard brain. It. I need the lizard brain to work. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, hey, yes, your brain you to control your tactical shelf. This is true. Hey, Steve, no, I can ask you a question. Where'd you get a? Where'd you get the nickname Yeti, and who gave it to you? God, that's been floating around for dozens of years. Uh, I want to say the first person to really coin it and use it was Alan Normandy from Battlecom. Probably around two thousand and eight, seven ish. Alan, I, I met Alan. Um, I was working uh, AIing with another instructor, and Alan, you know, the battle comps were just coming on market. And I, I called Alan, um, you know, doing the typical industry influencer. Hey, man, I'm an instructor. Can you give me free battle comps? Um, and it was actually, hey, bro, like, I saw one of these things. I want to use one. I want to put some rounds on it. Tell me how much and where do I get it from? And that turned into a four-hour, five-hour conversation with me and Alan, who was still copping out in California at the time. And... He's like, hey, I got to do something, whatever. So Alan immediately gets off the phone and like checks me out. Like he, he gets the phone calls going and like I'm getting text messages. And he's like, hey, man, Alan Norman, you just called me to, to verify some shit. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, dude. I don't give a fuck. And next thing you know, me, me and Alan have been friends for over a decade now. Um, I've shot stuff for him, prototype stuff for him, done all kinds of things. And he's just a great human being. And, you know, we first, you know, he's like, bro, you're like a monster. You're like a freaking Yeti. I'm like, okay, cool, whatever. And next thing you know, th there it is, you know. So Al Alan was the first one to really coin that. That's awesome. I want to talk. Um, Great dude. I will verify that he is an awesome guy. Yeah, Bill. I wanted to ask you, where do you think this class? And then I want to kick it back over to Steve. Uh, where do you think this class should fall on a student's continuum of training? Like, when should they take this class? Oh, Be careful gosh, what you uh, say, woman. I <laughs> wish they could take it so much earlier, so that when they get to the advanced classes, they can actually shoot the gun. Ooh. Um, Ooh. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I am one of the ways of doing things that I have blatantly stolen from Steve and I've told him that I've stolen it and I've credited the piece that credited the pieces that I've needed to is really simplifying the terms that I use and taking those tidbits that 
we have a tendency not to give to students until they're in more advanced classes and just giving it to the brand new people right away. And oh my gosh, the results are, are just so much better. I mean, like there's all these steps of fixing stuff that I don't have to go through because 75% of them just did it right the first time because they got the right piece of simple information that they could actually apply into a physical action. You checked in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Steve? What, uh, what do you, where do you think this should fall on a student's uh, continuum of training? It, it, should, it should be, I, I mean, realistically, it, it's a course of just, if you're going to go to a shooting class, this is one of the shooting classes you take, right? It, it doesn't matter what your skill set is. Tim Heron could come into this class and learn something. It may not be exactly whatever, but it, it could be something that Tim would say, I can use this with such and such in my program, or I could use this, right? Because because the, the end result is this, right? It, 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 it's these things, it's this thingy, this, don't move the gun. That's it. That's, that is literally it. Crisp sights. 100% shooting. Clean sights, crisp trigger. I don't even care how clean the sights are. Yeah, I agree. What, based on the distance, the value of the target, the distance and percentage of the shot. It matters in most, what, what, you know, me being a big defensive shooter, uh, which is my, which has been my whole life other than some small time in the game, gaming world, which is great, which I still love. I wish I had more time to do. Me but too. The thing is the me too. To be, I know, right? Hey, okay, Tim, be an instructor. You'll have time to shoot more. Shut and the thing mouth. is this, the sights only have to be in a shut your dirty mouth, right? Yeah. And the thing is this, the sights only have to be as relevant as the size of the target and the time frame to engage the target. They are not this absolutely perfect four, six, 90 degree right angles that, that are a perfect absolute sight and height and all this bullshit. Because let's be real, all pistol sights are not equal height, equal sight, equal light. That they absolutely are not. Um, and everybody's like, well, 490 degree right angles. Well, that old analogy was great until you have HD sights and you know, tank sights and all these other things. These things don't exist in a perfect world. And the sights only have to be as relevant. Once there's meat on three sides of the gun, and there's this notch and post floating somewhere in the chest box or the head box. Hey, man, what are you waiting for? Stop over verifying what you have already seen. The shooting world is an entire game of emotional control and visual perception and visual input. That's all it is. It's emotional control because the direct relation of the emotion you put into the gun directly relates to the output of the gun. That's one. What have you seen? And once you've seen it, what are you trying to re-see? It's already there. The gun is already out for a reason. It's already put up. Shoot the gun. That's it. Now, if, if you want to be that person, which, and there's nothing wrong with that for the focus aspect where you're shooting like bullet sized dots, you're putting in a false, a falsehood of shooting because now, now I have to retrain from this. Ah, finally to, Oh my God, this, which people are going to do this anyways, when it comes to be that time, that point in time, they're going to get on the gun. They're going to press the trigger. They're going to slap the trigger. They're going to come off the trigger. They're not going to sit there and go, Oh, that was such a good, Great. stop it. It's not going to happen. The gun's going to come out. You're going to see the first best sight picture, was, which is the only sight picture you will ever get, which is the first one. And that will always be your best one. And you're going to press that trigger immediately. Period. I like it. Now, there, there is a degree of proficiency that comes from people that get that education. And I was learning to decide, like me or Tim, we're like, hey, man, I want to shoot some 50-yard headshots on a USPSA or a target. You bet I'm going to do a little bit different trigger press. My speed may be different than the trigger press, but it's still going to be the same as far as how I press the trigger. But my speed will change from the, the, the five-yard grip and rip shot to a, a more methodical touch press roll. Okay. The only thing that changed is my velocity of the press. And I may refine the sights a slight bit more for that five and a half inch head box at 50 yards. Sure, absolutely I will. But I'm still pressing the trigger the same way. I'm not stacking, stopping at the wall, re-verifying, readjusting, and then adding, 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 breaking. No, I'm going to do it, but it's just a different velocity. But it's consistent. That's where people are wrong. So kind of going down this rabbit hole a little bit then. Let's go down this rabbit hole. Too. Yeah. It's dark and deep and I like it. Just like <laughs> so, Sorry, go ahead. Like sight deviation. 
let's, yeah. let's let's talk about site deviation because I think a we lot did of this listeners, drilling class. I I uh, we I do I do this drilling class. I know you do this drilling class. Um, I think every good instructor that's worth their their merit and worth their their own weight should be doing this drill and teaching students the importance of what what proper you know what site deviation is uh, first of all. So obviously nobody is listening to the show to listen to me talk. So I want I want to ask you what is your what is your uh, dictation I guess on uh, site deviation and how do you work that in your in your class curriculum? So I tell students, you know, perfect site picture is the first best one you get. That's the first best site picture you get. If there's a notch in post and that or that dot is somewhere in the window, if it's a dot site, if it's in the window, shoot the gun. Doesn't have to be centered because you are not going to get a dot because the way the human eyes and brain seek out symmetrical. So people will try to play like the square peg round hole ball game from when they were like five. It's not right. Stop it. You have a notch in post. It's there, shoot the gun. It's there, shoot the gun. Out to 25 yards, you are still going to be in an A zone as long as you have a relatively good enough grip on the gun and a clean enough consistent trigger press, regardless of the deviation of the sights. You're going to be inside a 6 by 11 box. You will be inside an 8-inch circle at those distances. And I show it. And I let the students I tell you, man, stop over-verifying what you are seeing. Now, if you tell me I've got a 25-yard brain box shot, yeah, I'm going to refine them a little bit more, obviously for a very precise eye box shot, sure. Very few and far between ever, but I will do that. But that's that's a learning curve part. But my site deviation is this, we'll do it at seven, 10, whatever, 15 yards in the course. We'll, we'll do it just as an example. I'm like, hey, I want you to move the gun, crank the sights in the window to the left, crank them to the right, crank them high, crank them low, let the gun swirl and let the gun move because it's always moving. It's never absolutely 100% perfectly still. Just shoot the damn pistol when they're relevant. Stop re-verifying things that you have already saw once. Because we know when you try to over-verify the sights, you're doing a couple of actions. You're, you're on the trigger. You're adding pressure while verifying. And then you're trying to, and then you stop the trigger press. And then the sights, and this is why people do this and they grab the gun late. Or they grab the gun early, which causes their misses. Not the trigger press. It's still the grip. But in that site, the problem is when you try to over-verify it, it never gets any better after the first one. It never does. It gets worse. And then you try to grab the gun harder. And then the sights move even more genius instead of relaxing the grip to let this kind of stop. So, so this is, it, it is, it's literally a rabbit hole. But I let the students work site deviation. I'm like, I just want you to shoot the gun whenever the sights are the most relevant. And stop over-refining them. It's the easiest way to tell them to do it. Draw it out on the target, whatever the case is. However, I explain it. Same thing with the red dot and the pistol. I'll grab the pistol and I'll like, hey, look, this is where the sights are. Crank, it's in the window. Look, it's over here in the window. I'll shoot it. I'll demo it. And I'll let them play with it. And then I have another exercise that I use that kind of reinforces that. But they need to understand, trust what you saw the first time and just shoot the pistol and stop worrying about if the sight blade is slightly above it. Stop worrying if the sight blade is buried in the notch. Stop worrying about it if the sight blade is to the left or to the right in the window. Stop worrying about your red dot being absolutely centered because that doesn't exist. Because <laughs> it's a dot inside an oval or a square or something else. Those things do not line up. Square peg round hole game. No. This is not 1950s bullseye shooting. There it is relevant. It's not relevant for what we do with a gun in the game world or the defensive shooting world, unless it is a very high percentage risk shot. And even then, most people should not take it because they're not confident in taking that shot anyways. We were talking about defensive accuracy, um, and I know there are some some instructors that, that use that as a, a caveat. Combat effective. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Right? Like, it's good enough. Um, and... Talk to us about some of the distances and standards that you're holding students to uh, in this <laughs> class. And I've heard, and I don't know, I've heard that you, you start them off at like 25 yards or somewhere there about. You're going to live at 25 until you get it right. <laughs> so I, I, I used to, I played with this for a while in the quote unquote critical class. Um, you shoot up, you show you shoot a proficiency, the first drill cold. 25 yards, 10 rounds, B8 or a 5 by 7 chest box. On my particular combative targets, it's a reduced A zone. It's literally 5 by 7 
which I feel is very relevant uh, in actual shootings and seeing human bodies cut up and open and where the vitals are and all that stuff. Five by seven is very relevant for peripheral shots, profile shots, center chest, back, whatever. B8 is very relevant uh, because of the size of the target. The five and a half inch middle is very relevant to human head and heart. Same thing as basically on a USPSA size target. It's about a five and a half inch six you know, zone. Um, and it was, it was 25 yards, 10 rounds cold on the range. And I'd step up on the range first thing in the morning and I'd demo it in front of the students cold like I will every exercise I ask them to perform. Um, I actually played with a proficiency test. If you showed up to the class, hey, cool, you're, you're good. You want to come to critical handgun or critical whatever? Sweet. Um, yeah, bro, you didn't pass the proficiency exam cold. Pack your shit and go home. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, this, this is it. This is on demand cold performance. You don't get a warm up in life. Sorry about your bad luck if your proficiency skills aren't there and that didn't go well. Um, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so I use a lot of B8s, uh, two and a half, three inch circles, um, five by seven chest boxes, uh, brain boxes, and, and six by 11 A zones on my targets um, because they're all relative to everyone. I have a practice target that's literally two B8s, eight three inch circles, and two six by 11 A zones. I, I can do everything in that practice session with that target that I need to do for 500 rounds, literally. Um, I'm very big on, I won't say perfection, but the proficiency to the best of their abilities at the time they have. And so I will let students put points on the board now initially so I can confirm where their pistols are actually hitting because zeroing a handgun is real. If you don't zero your gun, you have nothing. I ask guys, you have, you all have rifles, right? Yeah. How many, what's the first thing you do when you get out of the box? We zero it. I'm like, why don't you zero your handgun? And I get blank stares. The first thing I do with a gun is I get out of the box and I shoot it and I zero it. I either drift adjust the sights, I put Dawson adjustables on them or a red dot. Because the day, that day that I zero that gun, that, that's my day of shooting. That's how I'm performing that day. That may change a week from now when I'm injured, like right now with a torn rotator cuff and a busted up wrist. That changes. I may need to put three or five clicks on that gun now because something has changed. And I, I tell students this, it's like, where did you, where do you start today in this proficiency? Are you at 175, 50 or 25%? Where did you start today? And what has changed now? Is it the weather? Is it you know stuff at home? The kids, are, I, I don't care, but where are you? So my proficiency stuff starts with B8s. I use a lot of them. Um, then I use a lot of them at speed, which is relative to the student's abilities to hit. Um, there's a there's a performance qual standard at the end of class. There, there's there's just a lot of little things that will take some other drills and exercises and use them. Um, and this course that Bell was at gave me an opportunity to play with some curriculum changes because I'll use students as guinea pigs. I absolutely will for things. And I'll tell them, hey man, I'm I'm going to test bed you guys on some stuff, and I want thoughts. Sure, why not? My my storyline in this last class was B8 still everything is in the black. And pick your poison at the speed you want to shoot it at. Pick your poison. And so it was, you know, seven yards, 10 yards, 15 yards, you know, and everybody starts falling apart at 20, 25 because they never shoot it because everybody's an Instagram celebrity at five yards, three yards with their pistol and one reload once. Agreed. Or whatever it is they're doing on a full size piece of steel at three yards. <clears throat> Man, that was a 0.65. Bro, you shot the gun from here and you hit him in wherever. I don't know. The fallacy of combat effective combat accuracy is just that it's bullshit. It's been perpetuated by people who cannot fucking shoot and by weak people. We understand that, yeah, metal inside of somebody is a good thing, quote unquote, regardless of where it's hit. You slash, you got two of these things, you know, these lungs things that, that help. You have a heart, you have all these things. We've talked, people talk about timers and switches and all this bullshit. I don't care. Walking wounded are very real. Walking dead are very real. People that have been shot and shot multiple times that haven't been in vital scoring zones are still capable of killing you. So if I can deliver and get students to deliver five to seven rounds in a cadence or a string of fire inside that B8 black zone, that five and a half inch circle at their rate, their pace of their max speed, that's a win. Now they have something they can work on and now they can press their speed so they fall apart. And now they can go faster because let's be real, if you can't control a gun at five yards, to get 10 rounds out in 2.5 from the draw, you're, you're wrong. Bell saw it. She saw it in class. You know, I'll use a super test as a measure. And, you know, 15 yards, 10 rounds, 15 seconds. That's points on the board. That's a control mechanism. 10 yards, 10 rounds, 10 seconds. 
control mechanism. Five yards, 10 rounds, five seconds. If you're not putting them in three and under, you're probably going to fail something at that distance. You should be running that gun at max cadence velocities. And then I'll look at the timer and I'll hit splits in the point one four one five when I'm on the gun hard and I'm making a gun sing. Absolutely, I will. Do I expect my students to do that? No, because I'm not going to outperform them in one fashion or another. There's other ones that I will. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm not there to show off either. Oh, I have to give the students the ability to see what I'm doing because they're visual learners. They're the ones that learn through being told and shown and demoed. And I have to break those down at times to 50, 60% speeds. And there's times I get on the gas. I'm like, yeah, watch this, Ricky Bobby. I'm going to right turn into the wall in Talladega and NASCAR because there is no right turn. So I'm about to crash and burn. And I will. And I, and I will. There are other exercises that I will do that are purposeful misses that I will actually drive the wrist, crank the grip, do something differently in front of the students. I'll tell them, hey, watch what is going on here. I'm going to explain your misses. I'm going to give you the whys instead of oftentimes trying to make them better and undo 20 years of bad habits in 8, 16, 20 hours. I will show them the whys of the wrong so they understand why they did it and how not to do it again and how to correct that action. I will show them like, Hey, that shot at, at you know, one o'clock, you know what that is? I'm overextending and I'm touching the trigger and I'm trying to make the gun fire by extending. And when I overextend, I lock this, I change this muscle group, I lock this and I've shoved the gun up and I punch the grip upwards as I'm doing it. I will factually miss and I will show them the misses. And I'll tell them, hey, I'm gonna miss these targets in this action. And this is why you guys are doing it. And they go, yeah, I see that now. This is why we're doing this. And like, exactly. So now you know the why is behind it. So don't do it. It's like talking to a five-year-old, don't touch the hot stove. They're gonna do it. And they learn by touching the hot stove. So don't do that. And I will show them that. And I will explain it to them. I tell them, hey, and they, and they ask me. And, and there's, there's a little thing that I write down at, at the beginning of class. And I'm like, where, where the hell's my camera? I'm like, I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Yeah, that right there. And it says, it's basically I-F-U-D, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, if you don't know who does, if you don't know why you're doing it, why are you still doing it? Because it's obviously not working for you and it's not right. So stop doing it. It's that easy. If you don't know who does, and if you're still doing it, it's wrong. So why are you still doing it? Definition, definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. Why would you still do something that you know is not working and is not correct? Agreed. And that's the answer to shooting. That's the entire answer to shooting. If you don't know who does. Because if you don't know it, why are you still doing it, hero? <laughs> Makes tons of sense. So I have a couple questions, one for Tim and one for Bell. So first, Tim, i got to ask you, as a competition shooter, how much time do you spend thinking about self-defense and defensive shooting and stuff like that? Is it, is it something it. In, your, in your your mindset, or is it more just USPSA? No, actually, I do. I spend a lot of time because I don't believe – I'm one of the very few, I think, competition shooters – I don't want to say very few competition. There's a lot of accomplished competitive shooters that understand that there really isn't a definitive wall between competition shooting and defensive shooting. Um, there really isn't. Running the gun is running the gun is running the gun. So wrong. Wrong. I'm wrong. Wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. There we go. <laughs> You're wrong. You're wrong. But, but I mean, as far as, as far as the, the importance of accuracy and yeah. what it means to put shots on demand and things like that, I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about, because I mean, me being, me being a, a teacher and instructor as well, I'm not, even though I'm coming from a competitive background, right? A lot of my class, like student base though, anymore isn't necessarily just from the competitive side of things. So being able to show a relevance in what it is I'm teaching and have it be applicable to, to, to a defensive mindset. And that defensive mindset, honestly, is no different when it comes to actually running a gun or the capabilities of what it takes to run a gun at speed or run a gun at, you know, the, at, at absolute accuracy on demand or whatever, whatever the, the, you know, the synapses or, or what it is I'm asking a shooter to do is, you know, I, I, I think about things just the same way. I mean, you know, can I incapacitate someone, 
you know, with accuracy at 25 yards, you know, I better be able to do that on demand. So yeah, I, I agree just with Steve, the same thing, you know, as far as cold on demand standards, they're real. Mm -hmm. And there's something that I work on just as much um, in the competitive side as I would also in the defensive side, whether I'm working with, uh, you know, a, a full competition, you know, 1911, or I'm working, you know, with a my Glock 48 or my J frame from freaking concealment. That's the standards that I want to achieve. And that's why, because I see the importance on both sides of the house. Good stuff. So and Steve and I have this talk, this conversation weekly all the time, you know, and, yeah, and to, to understand that to the, the relevance there is this the same. I mean, running a pistol is running a pistol is running a mm -hmm. pistol. So. It, 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 sights and triggers are sights and triggers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a story that it's just bumpy things are red dot and trigger and it's a lever and you press it and the gun is stable and you shoot it. That's mm -hmm. it. Now where people where people lose their mind about competition versus defensive shooting. No <laughs> way for this. <laughs> well, you know, those, those competition guys, man, they just shoot two rounds anywhere. If it's an AC, A D, whatever, da, 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 they do they move on and it's just about going fast. It's a fucking game. To win the game, you win the rules, you shoot the gun, and that's it. Most of the guys, and, and I know a lot of USPC guys are competitive shooters. I know a lot of them that don't carry a gun. But they yeah. shoot at a very high standard. I, they are not I, gun carriers. I, they are yeah. not that mindset. They're they're a, they're a, they're an athlete. They're a sportsman. They play a game. Right? Exactly, and and that's beautiful. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I've, I've shot two gun, three gun. I've shot some outlaw stuff. I've shot IDPA. It's fun. I love it. I shot metallic silhouette. Hell, because I'm a big hunter with handguns. And the thing is, people on the internet like this to be well competition shooting. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, bro, it's a game. If you can't tell the difference between some stationary cardboard targets. <laughs> Yeah. And a human being, you have bigger things. But if you can shoot the gun well, right? I know what's acceptable to me on target to target transitions on cardboard one meter spaces and in depth or whatever in, in lateral transitions. I know what's acceptable to me. I also understand that when it becomes time and it's a human being, it's probably a lot different. And it is. It is a lot different. But it's still just shooting a gun. And if you can shoot a gun to a level of proficiency, that's great. I'm not going to sit there and tell you you need to do this. Well, I shot a two second build drill. Who cares? Right. That's great from a proficiency standpoint on a static piece of cardboard. You're not going to shoot a two second build draw on a human being that is moving and it's not going to be perfect. <clears throat> that That's the only damn difference. The cardboard moves. I, I think um, Mike Voigt said it best when Mike Voigt described the perfect shot and what that perfect shot was. And, and so I don't butcher it. I'll have to look it up again because I, I had it in some old notes when, when Mike first really explained it to me. And God bless him. I mean, great dude. Huge loss in the community. Yeah. But it was basically this. It's a, you know, the perfect shot. The gun is never still. Real targets are usually moving. Your sights are never right or wrong. They're only left or right. -handed. I like that. <clears throat> and and yeah. Mike said it best. There was no better way that I could ever explain it than that right there about the perfect shot. I love it. You know, I think uh, I think you guys exactly kind of covered exactly what my question was trying to get at. And like you're talking about with the USPSA guys, competition like Tim, I think Tim's smart enough that if he's ever in a self-defense situation at Walmart here in Albuquerque, because we live here, that he's <laughs> going to shoot more than two times, you know, uh, if necessary. But, you know, he's not going to unload and show clear when he's done. <laughs> right. I'm Are not going gonna... to wait for a beep. I'm not. Exactly. And it's, there's so much. Gonna... Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much that, that's, that's the, uh, un, unfortunately, that's so much misunderstanding between yeah. guys that don't do you know, like they, they purposely avoid competition because they feel like, you know, they, because they heard somebody parrot something that parroted yeah. somebody else that was completely fucking wrong. Killed in the it, streets. Right. When it came it'll, to, it'll oh, you know, streets. well, competition is, is, is bad. And, you know, it, it develops bad habits and things like that. I, I don't care who you are or what background you come from, right? I don't need, and I, I this sounds kind of kind of weird to say, like I don't feel like I need a tactics course to teach me how to look for fucking cover when bullets are coming at me. Your Nobody natural ever does. your natural <laughs> human instinct Nobody to survive does. is get the fuck out of the way. Shit's coming at you. You know, that's like saying, oh, I had to be trained to jump out of the way of a moving semi coming down the highway about ready to hit me versus, oh, well, you know, you're, you're standing in the, in the middle of a, I hate this term too, flat or square range, and you're just shooting targets that, that don't shoot back at you. It's like, bro, whether you're LE or, or law enforcement or military, right? Like, proficiency is proficiency. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
And 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 it's, it's actually a USPSA is kind of I hate to, it, it, IDPA as well is this some of the only gun games or gun disciplines that you can actually yes you're shooting on I guess what you would consider a square or flat range that you can actually get a level of dynamic movement and dynamic shooting where you're shooting 180 degrees to the left, 180 degrees to the right. You're shooting prone. You're shooting kneeling. You're shooting leaning around barricades left and right. You're shooting off balance, right? It's one of Tell the easiest ways to get an opportunity to test the expansion of all those skills. Absolutely. So to have somebody that, and this happens to me quite frequently, I get told, oh, stay in your lane. You're just a competition teacher. You know, you should stick to competition. And I, in fact, Steve and I had this conversation the other night with it, in fact, it's an argument or, or disagreement with, I think, a student of yours, you know, and it was, it was just one of those things. He was like, oh, yeah. I mean, he completely dismissed what I had to say because he was like, oh, yeah. That's right. You come from competition. I'm like, bro, you know, human anatomy is human anatomy. You know, um, how the human work, how the human body works is how it works, regardless of whether it's self-defense or whether it's competition. Mm -hmm. Running a gun is running a gun is running a gun. And it, but he immediately just became dismissive. And I, I hate I hate that. And it's become my life's work. And that, that's how Steve and I have, have gotten to know each other. Yeah. It's become my life's work to be on this side of the house, but to show that I, everything is relative. It re really is. Shoot, sh shooting is shooting and then there's tactics. Right. Correct. So, so I then think the, the, that's, it. Oh, that's fine. I think, I think what, what we're kind of boiling down to here is, you know, and I, I, this isn't really a question. I just wanted to make a statement from my observation from going from the, uh, you know, concealed carry instructor to a, mm -hmm. TC instructor, instructor kind of, you know, path that I'm on. I had an opportunity to shoot a competition with Tim and Andy and a couple of other of our friends. Um, I think Joe was there and Jose. And what I realized was I was running a lot of the same types of drills that I was running concealed carry. And I was trying to do them fast. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's just, it's a competition either way you look at it, whether it's a competition for your life or a competition for the top, you know, leader on the board. So it, it is. And, you know, I'll tell you this, uh, one of my best friends, uh, Chuck Pressburg, mm -hmm. Chuck, Chuck has a really good uh, video on either his YouTube or his Patreon about that, about like one of his matches that he first shot when he first shot his USPSA match, he lost his mind about it. I know he called Tim at some point <laughs> about it as well. And I, and I, and I laughed as soon as he called me, he's like, bro. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I get it. But Chuck comes from a different dynamic background where his life was taking other lives. Factually, he, he, he came from a place where his job was saving lives by taking other human beings lives. And failure was not an option. In that. So while this half of the game world is like, well, we can do this. That's just it. It's the game part. We understand the other half of the equation. Right. Right. I, I mean, and I told Tim this one day, I think joking around, I said, I would love to see a USPSA match be all force on force. Whew. Same target array, same scenarios. Let's do it force on force. Now put 10 dudes out there. It's a no win. You're never going to win it. It's the game. Right. And that's the best part about it. It's fun. You're shooting. You're doing all these things and people lose their mind over it. And, and let's be real. Both sides, both sides push the buttons. The the, the 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 game guys are the biggest egos I have ever run into in the industry. <laughs> they yes. have the biggest egos. Like, hey, bro, that's cool. I want you to do it with your carry gun. What are you talking about? I don't carry a pistol. We'll settle down then. <laughs> well, what are you, <laughs> you willing you know, to so bet? What are you willing to bet that guys on both sides, proficient or not, still don't have the balls to do what it takes if something did go down anyways? True. Because we've seen it. We've seen it. The I mindset, mean, isn't that the kind of the there. core of all of it? Was that if you don't have that, it doesn't it doesn't matter how well you run the gun in either avenue. It, you're, 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 Bell, you're exactly right. Hey, hey Bell, we, we know of guys. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'll, 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 I'll turn it back over to you, Steve. But I, I will say this. When I was competing with Andy and Tim and the other guys, um, I did actually uh, – I'm not sure, Tim, you can clarify, but I, I lost points or time or something because I shot – some targets out of order. I had, it was, we were supposed to lean out to, to shoot a steel target and I shot it from the right side of the barricade or whatever. And, you know, they didn't disqualify me, but 
I still saw the target and engaged it, which means I still was training, if you will, or practicing, if you will. But you didn't follow the rules. <laughs> <laughs> That's what gets you killed in the streets. <laughs> hey, I would much rather Tim, uh, you know, put a bad guy down and unload and show clear than to see another guy on Instagram do the damn tactical uh, scan. <laughs> that he's, he's nothing. I right? think we had a discussion in that class. <laughs> it's like, come on, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stop hey, that Bill. stupid shit. Hey, Bell, uh, let me ask you a question getting back to class and you're talking about that now. I think it's a good time. What's the one thing that you improved the most on in his course? What what changed you? What was that aha moment? Uh, Her ability to put the swear intolerance? words together. <laughs> <laughs> putting, up uh, with, putting up with Steve, is that was that the answer? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I, I struggled a lot with fatigue uh, at the end of each day. And that's always been a factor for me. Um, I can I can always perform at that higher percentage at the beginning of the day, and my percentage drops pretty dramatically. Um, I definitely appreciated the opportunity to get a little bit more insight to the red dot, but you know, I I knew going in that it was going to be the same, and it is the same. But for me, it was the reps. I mean, I don't get the opportunity to shoot that many rounds in a weekend ever, ever. I, I don't, it just doesn't happen for me. So getting the trigger time was by far the most valuable. And I, I came away with just a all around general improvement just from having that time on the range. Nice. What would you say your your goal was from that class? What what's something that you did you have any preconceived notions going into it? Is there something that you you know you was hey I need to this oh, is what yeah. I need to work on? I was gonna steal from Steve the plan oh, the whole yeah. time. That's that I didn't take notes on purpose because then he'd be on to me, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean I, my goal is that I I do uh, fall down on my own skills because I'm spending so much time trying to get other people to try and come take training and get their own skills bumped up. So I don't, I don't get that kind of time. And I was definitely falling behind from the level that I should be at for what I'm doing. And I was hoping to really start working on climbing that staircase again. And I think I got a good couple steps started anyway. That's, uh, you know, yeah. we hear that a lot, you know, and uh, Steve, you made the joke earlier, you know, if you, if you really enjoy shooting and you want to do it some more, start teaching. Um, you know, and I think that's a common, <laughs> right. And, and so you see these, these instructors Wrong. that like shooting, they start teaching, yeah. they net that, but they don't have time to, they don't have time to get on the trigger themselves. So what, what's some advice that you have for those folks, the instructors that come through your class and, and maintaining or improving their, their shooting abilities. Quit being lazy. Quit being lazy. Um, no, so, so here's the thing for me, like, so last year and this year, over 60 classes, 250 some days on the road. The last thing I want to do when I get home to cut the grass, put up firewood, pay bills, do everything I'm supposed to be doing is practice. The last thing I want to do is go to the range, put on my kit and shoot my guns. It, it is. And it's terrible because if you would have asked me this 20 years ago when I started, dude, I was on the range all the time. When I was at the height of my career field of shooting, really shooting, uh, and that was during the Magpul era when I was working. Dude, I was shooting 60,000 rounds of pistol a year. 50 to 60,000 rounds of handgun a year. And carbine, it was another 50 to 60,000 a year. I was on top of it. You know, swipe the corporate charge card, man. More practice ammo. Yeah. And But we were there to be at a performance level, right? I had to be fast. I had to be the guy that was... And literally, there was a video floating around the net for years of me at a class in Colorado with a carbine where I dumped 16 rounds in two seconds from a low ready presentation in an A zone. And guys looked at me and lost their freaking mind. Like, what just happened with that gun? I'm like, hey, dude, this is where I've been up to. And this is why my wrists don't work anymore. And this is why my hands don't work anymore. And everything cramps up and everything is broken on me. I overworked everything. You ask Jerry Micklick. Look at Jerry. He's had his elbows replaced, rebuilt, hips. I mean, whatever. Sooner or later, the machine breaks down. And while it is good to get a rest point. All right, it is. But you still have to maintain a certain proficiency level. My practice sessions now are 100 to 150 rounds. 
I, I go shoot. I'll, I'll, I'll do a cold hit on a B8. Great. I can firm zero on the guns. You know, I'll shoot a B8. This is where I'm shooting this day. This is how it works. I do a 10 round slow fire exercise. Kick ass. All right. I'm good. Then I work some speed work at five and seven yards. Get the gun out and let the gun feed, man. Just get on the gun and see where I'm giving up the gun. Where am I loosening up the grip? Where am I giving things up this day? What is wrong with me? Um, how I'm seeing particular targets. Uh, and I will shoot 100, 150 rounds in my practice session. And, and truthfully, that's all I need to stay at a quote unquote, what I would consider a maintenance level. And I shoot a various, various couple of exercises that I have. That's what I do. That's my practice session. And that's where I'm at, but I don't want to go practice. I, I, I don't want to come off the gun, come off the road after being out for a month, which happens quite often, and then go home and go, I'm going to go unpack all my shit and repack my shit and go to the range today and go shoot. I'm like, <laughs> no. You know what I'll do? I'll grab my 22 rifle. I'll grab my old nylon 66, and I'll go to the range, and I will shoot shotgun shell hulls and, and clay pigeons off the range and chunks of them in the berm. I go have fun with the gun. It's not that fucking serious. Stop it, superhero. Like it. Tuck the red cape back in. Damn you're, you're not here. This is what this isn't what you do, right? And I'll take my gun. I'll go shoot it. I'll have fun, and then I'll go in the safe and I'll dig through the the boxes of shit. I'm like, yeah, no, yeah, I'm gonna go play with this gun. And I was like, I'm gonna go take my J frame out. Nobody said ever, and go practice with my J frame, right? Like because it's a stupid gun. I don't. Yeah, I'm going to go play with my 22. I'm going to go shoot something fun again. You know, I'm just going to be a kid with my guns because that's fun and you have to do that because if you're that serious, you're in the wrong business. Stop oh, it. You need that mental break, but I but I will drive. Yeah, I'll, I'll I've take some time out of life. I, I bought one of those 16-inch uh, Heritage 22s, you know, the barrel's like this long. We shot yeah. that this weekend. We had a blast with that stupid gun. It was it was fun. Right. It was fun. It was a good time. And it was a, it was a stress yeah. reliever more than anything because we weren't thinking about even hitting the target. We were just pulling the damn trigger just because it was cool. It was fun. It's fun, right? It's fun again. And for me, yeah, I'll, I'll dry fire. And people are like, oh, dry fire practice. Exciting. I'm like, stop it. Dry fire practice is not exciting. Hence the name dry. <laughs> yes. Right? yes. It's dry. It's boring. It's dry. <laughs> boring. It's dry. Hence the name dry fire. It's boring. I'm not even firing a gun. It's just dry, right? It's dull. It's like being on a date with your cousin. And, <laughs> you know, and, and this is the thing. So I'll get out there and the guy's like, well, what's your dry fire practice? Oh, you know what my dry fire practice is? 20 presentations of the gun. And I'll build up the speed. Great. Once the gun lands consistently to the same natural point for me, I'm good there. Oh, and then I'll break down the next isolating step and I'll present the gun the same thing, but now I'll add a trigger press. Great. So now I've learned to press the trigger again. Ooh. And then I'll add in, guess what? Wait for it. Maybe some target to target transition with a presentation and a press of the trigger again. It's, 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 it, then, oh, yeah, I'll do some reloads. Great. I'll put a box in the box on the gun. Newsflash defensive shooters, you're never going to reload the gun in the defensive shooting. No. <laughs> There's been well, reloads are actually document. fun. That's like one yeah. of the few things that's actually fun to practice. Don't spoil everything. <laughs> it's stupid because here's a, you've got a modern pistol with 17, 18, 10 rounds in the gun. Modern <laughs> pistol. <laughs> Who carries that shit? As I'm carrying <laughs> two a 120 <laughs> year old gun, right? It's one, two, two world, world wars. wars right? Right. <laughs> two world wars. Right? That's not, right. not to mention like the BAR. Like I don't carry a BAR around. I would if you gave me a Browning BAR because who doesn't want to do a class with a 30 odd six BAR? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my dry fire is very limited. My dry fire practice is just that when I want to break up the dry fire, which people hate, but I'll tell you this <clears> Mantis X. I'll, I'll use a Mantis system because it breaks up the dry fire monotony. It's something different. There's some visual on the iPad or whatever it is I'm using. That, that's my designator for that. But it, actually in doing that with people and students and developing a quote unquote program around the Mantis, it gets them in the habit of playing with the gun. Yeah. Because it's like a video game within terms the gun playing with the gun and their equipment getting more familiar with it manipulations of the gun hey, look i've reloaded the gun great but that's what it does it gets them out of that space of because let's be real most people are not as serious as a lot of us here right they're not but if you give them a game with it 
the mantis, right? Which is not a game. It's a good diagnostic tool. It has some merit. Sure. I don't milk the grip, but whatever, because it doesn't have nipple soccer. But <laughs> what it does, it gets, them in, it, it gets them in the habit of touching the gun, playing with the gun, getting some more proficiency with the gun because they have immediate feedback where they may not be in the mindset of myself, Tim, Bell, Caleb, you know, Tom Lloyd, all these other dudes that are proficient in their shooting that they can diagnose it in their dry fire because they because efficiency. Because you ask Bell will probably to answer this and Tim, how many times do you ask people, do you guys dry fire? Like, <laughs> well, you still suck. So obviously your dry fire isn't working. So why? Because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, there's books out there on dry fire. You can from Steve Anderson, Ben. Uh, you know, there's a million books on this. You go back to days, you know, Barnhart. There's there's been so much stuff on dry fire, but the average dude who's working 16 hours a day isn't going to do it. But if you right. give them something that breaks up the dry part of it, they're more likely to use the gun and play with that toy. That's why I like that setup. And it gives them something, again, just to just to get out of that habit of it's just dry fire. I mean, most people, a lot of people don't take dry fire serious because they don't understand it. It's absolutely true. And I have a question for Bell real quick. And then I want Steve to answer the same question because <laughs> I had a, a really good friend of mine that I took a class from about oh, three or four years ago. I can't even remember now. And at the end of the class, it was a three-day course, and we were sitting at a sports bar having dinner, and he was the lead instructor, and we were sitting there kind of goofing around, and uh, we did a patch exchange, which, you know, I've got my, one of my patch balls behind me. It's the only thing left in this room because I'm moving. And we did a patch exchange, and I gave him one of mine, and he gave me one of his. And the patch that he gave me was... Steve's do work patch. <laughs> now, now the, the back, the back side of the story is about three or four months after that, I sent him a text with a picture of the patch. And he said, yeah, man, I really regret ever giving you that patch because I apparently it came directly from Steve. So what I did was I turned around and I, I found this on the internet and I'm not even sure where I found it, Steve, to be honest with you. And I sent him the patch products he gave me back to him at NRA when he was still working there. His name was Andy Lander. He was the senior TC yeah. wish app training counselor. And he had a couple of things to say to me. The first one I want to say just as a segue to what you guys were talking about, Bell. Um, one of the things that Andy Lander told me was use it twice and call it your own. So everything mm. you can steal from any instructor out there, use it twice and call it your own. The next question, or the that was a statement. The next question is, is what does this mean to you? And for those of you that are listening and not watching, I'm holding a patch up with a Minuteman, and the the phrase simply says, "Do work." So you want to know what that means to me? Yes. Okay. Are you so, get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich, woman. Oh. I use this. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes it means making sandwiches for. Uh, you know, I'm really dudes. That's fine. Um, I'm I'm not above that. You know, if I was, I'd have to turn in my woman card. I will make a sandwich. Okay. Um, no, for me, it's it's more of get rid of the laziness, quit making the excuses, get out there and do something each day. You know, I can't practice every day, but. There's nothing stopping me from thinking about what I need to improve on. There's nothing stopping me from making more connections with other people in the industry. There's nothing stopping me from doing those other things that I can combine with my heavy schedule. It, it means not wasting those hours. Um, somebody told me a long time ago, you know, Einstein had the same 24 hours in the day or, you know, whoever you want to pick that you he think is awesome. amazing. Uh, Thomas Edison, yeah, you know, wh whichever famous person had the same amount of hours in the day. And it's true, you know, we all have the same opportunity every day Agreed. to get something towards our personal goals done. And I suppose that would be, that would be what it means to me. I don't know how far off base from the original intent that is, Steve. Uh, 
<laughs> no, I think so. I will say that every time I finish an instructor level class where I'm certifying, you know, new pistol, rifle, whatever instructors that, that Andy and Jeremy and I teach, you know, down in Albuquerque and Dallas or wherever, I finish with this patch and this statement and I show it to him. I have it on my my uh, range vest over there in my in my uh, closet it's sitting right there on the chest. And I ask them. What does it mean? And then I explained to them that it means just what you just said, Bill, is go out there and do something. Take a class, teach a class, go to the range, take somebody to the range, do whatever you can do to further your skills and do it as often as you possibly can. So, Steve, you're you're the guy that 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 has coined this, so to speak. So what does do work mean to you? Hmm. <laughs> get better be better whatever it is that you're going after you're striving for your goals I, I don't care what it is just get out there and do the work put the time in. seek out the information seek out the knowledge seek out the information from everybody um and for me that was it it, it was if it's one more rep in the gym if it's one more mile in a walk if it's one more hour of your day and i don't care if you have to be up at 6 a.m you know, and I don't care. I mean, I go to bed at three o'clock in the morning, you know, I'm up at seven. I mean, it's, it's, it's what we do. I, I make use, I try to make use of every hour available to me to do something. If it's going over notes from a course, if it's looking at the next class coming up, if it's looking at my own equipment that I have to change pieces, parts on update manual, whatever it is, if it's one more thing that I need to work on with a sponsor or one more group of people I need to put together in this industry to make things happen, that's what I do. And, and that's what it is for me. Um, it's not just a shooting component. The shooting is the easiest part of this whole game. Let, let's be realistic. Shooting is so simple. Too many people complicate it like we've talked about, um, but it is the easiest portion. It's because people just don't put in the time. They don't do the work. And it's very easy. But if they don't know why, what, what work can they possibly do? You know, it's just it's a progression here. So for me, it, it, it's basically that. Just do work. Put in the time put in the effort, do something. And if there's nothing to do, find something to do. And that comes, that literally comes from the military. Um, and the first time I ever really heard that put in context was myself, Chuck, some of his guys were in a CQB course. Um, and like, hey man, if you don't have anything to do, do something, find work to do. If, if, if you're part of a six, eight, 12 man, whatever it is, four dudes, two dudes, I don't care. If there's nothing left to do, do something, but find work and do work. I was like, that made sense to me in more in more context than just anything else. Like, if there's nothing else to do, find something to do because you'll find it. There is always going to be work to do. Absolutely, no matter what it is, find Absolutely. it and do it. So, Andy, you had um, something you wanted to bring back around. Yeah, yeah. Do work, man. I'm a I'm a manager, as a couple of us are on here, and holy holy moly, I wish I could. Uh, <laughs> Our guys would listen. That was a that was a great time to uh to stop cursing right there. <laughs> holy moly, the go to instead of holy shit. Yeah, <laughs> right. So so find something to do, damn it. Anyway, um, thanks you thank you guys for all for coming on. I really appreciate it. This is uh, one of my favorite podcasts. I've I've got a, a lot of notes too, but we got it recorded, so that's good for me. Um, one you one quick standards. question. <laughs> hey, I do really low standards. Look at my friend. Yeah, exactly. hey, hey, we'll, drink, hey. we'll, we'll drink together. Trust me. We'll drink together. You'll see some standards. Perfect. Look at Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, Tim and Steve, first, you guys are friends. Y'all are buddies. You guys talk constantly, as you said. One three thing as far as firearms training that you don't agree on. Mm. Gosh, really not much. I don't think there really is. <laughs> we, we agree. We agree on way too much of it. That's the <laughs> problem, right? Like, there's there's not really anything to disagree on. It's that straightforward. Hey Tim, uh, do you do you fly fish at all? No. Okay. <laughs> then we, no, then we can't don't fly fish. Argument. We can't I, use the argument that he's not tall fish. enough to stand in the water to fly fish. <laughs> that's a terrible thing to ask a man. Oh, in a live the TV deep show. end of the pool is a kiddie pool for Tim. <laughs> The first time I ever fly fished was actually this summer when I was teaching a class up in Alaska and I got a day mm -hmm. away from teaching and shooting. And uh, my class host uh, took me out to the upper Kenai river. Nice. And uh, we fly fish for, for reds. 
And that was freaking awesome. And it made me want to do it even more. So, yeah. Yeah. So I I think my my point with that was, is is you guys can't argue about, you don't have to match the hatch. Just throw the buck. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it, it's true. We, we we don't we don't. That's what happens when you think you have when you have a lot of the the good stuff figured out. Um, Other than he really... shoots gamer loads, you know his, his forty five <laughs> game loads. We do. Okay, I'm like, bro, do. I'm like, bro, that's like eight hundred feet per second, dog. I got pellet guns that shoot faster than that. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We found one at least. There you go. <laughs> it, it, it's just a, it's just such a bullshit thing too we just laugh about like yeah nice gamer modes they got so much smoke coming out of those things like wow did you put extra lube in a barrel so that it made power factor or what? <laughs> oh man i have one question uh one more question that i want to ask you guys um and we've been on you know the, one of the longer episodes but that's that's great we'll go until y'all have to get off but um anybody that's sat in class with me knows my the only thing i'm worse at than shooting are, are my segues but I wanted to get back to, um, and it's a selfish question, um, Bell. What is a what are a couple of drills that you would recommend um, some students that are going to be taking this class do to prepare for it? Uh, I, know, uh, I know a lot of people just show up, but you know there are guys out there that want to want to run some drills. So what drills would you would you recommend? Uh, shoot B eights at twenty five yards. And make sure you can hit that thing. <laughs> B eights at twenty five. <laughs> make sure the gun is zeroed. B8 to yeah. 25. God. Oh, and don't take a full auto Glock to uh, a uh, <laughs> I saw one of yeah, Terry. Have, have, have decent other. gear. That that would definitely be up there too, is, is have some reasonable gear. Uh, Tim Tim would like combat speed bulls though. Tim would like the, the B8 speed bulls because it's 25 yards, 10 rounds, 10 seconds from the draw. For yeah, 90 but, points or better. You know, and, and honestly, I mean I, I laugh about B8 all the time. Because there is such an emphasis on it, but I do shoot B eights a lot. Yeah. So, and I definitely see the uh, the importance of doing so. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't don't let my, uh, you know, <laughs> don't let me making fun and laughing about it and, and rolling my eyes about B eights. I I only dislike B eights because they just get boring after a while. So then you oh find God, ways. Then then you find ways to make B eights challenging by adding part times or. You know, adding adding a, a, a higher accuracy standard to them or things like that. It's just like you do with every drill. So, you know, I, I definitely see the uh, the quality in shooters that that practice accuracy standards like V8s. So, I agree with you, Bill. I, I think V8s are good. What about you, Steve? What are some things that you would like students to do to prepare for your class, or some drills that they can practice? Show up with quality ammunition because ammo matters. Uh, especially in accuracy standards. Ammo does matter. It's very real. It's not bottom feeder 115. It's bullshit. Um, you know, it, it's a lot like any other thing. You know, 45 starts at 230 and 9 mil starts at 124. Um, and 556 starts at 62. It, it's, it's, it's real. It's very real in ammo, um, but people don't notice it. What I would say is practice, if you're going to come out, practice the proficiency in the weapons handling. It'll make the life easier. It will make life so much easier just having a proficiency of weapons handling of the gun and the manipulations. On top of that, uh, you know, bullseyes. And I don't care if it's 25 yards. I, I, I don't because I'll, I will get you there. All right. I will. But if you're really good at a bullseye at 10 yards, get really great at it at 10 yards by increasing the speed. Set a part time. Do something with it. Okay. Just don't sit there and do the slow fire on cutting the X out of 10 yards. That's great. You, you've lived in that world now. Now press the speed. Use the whole five inch of the B8 at 10 yards at speed for those 10 rounds. Well, they're not in this perfect little, shut up, stupid. I don't care, but they're all inside the black and they're at black at your max ordinance speed right now. That's good because I'm going to constantly change gears on you. I'm going to make you go fast. And then when we get done doing Ricky Bobby stupid stuff, I'm going to put you right back in the 25 or the 15 for B8s for 10 rounds because I'm going to bring you back to a place where I need you now to refocus again on a certain proficiency and skill set. Because anytime I get done going fast, I've got to get you back on a certain level because I can take anybody and put them on an A zone and let them get crazy with a gun and they'll be there. And then the old saying is, you know, I can I can take a, I can take a proficient shooter and, and basically get the wheels to fall off. You know, you can't take the wheels falling off a guy and that's all they do and make them a proficient, you know, B8 bullseye shooter for 100 point aggregate. It's, it's almost impossible because all they know is one gear. 
and that's go fast. That's go fast up close on a larger scoring zone. And that's where they live. And it's great too. But there has to be a happy balance in there. So practice both. Practice your speed work. Practice your, your precision work. Be a balanced shooter. Right. Andy, Judson, you, Tim, you guys have any uh, parting words or thoughts? Mm. I appreciate you letting me hang out on the show with with everybody. No, anytime. Uh, I'm glad we didn't let Bell talk. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was at least well entertained. Um, I, I saved my energy to go to the kitchen podcast. and make sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, they, listen, I was on the Plate Society podcast once. That did, yeah, oh yeah, that. they cried. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I was going to kick it over to to Bell. And then uh, Steve, what are your any parting thoughts for our listeners? Oh, I just appreciate you guys letting me come on and hang out with the boys. Um, oh, she's going to play time. that bullshit. Yeah. Don't, even start, <laughs> say something. Don't, don't even start your little obedience, sub, <laughs> subservient bullshit with me. I know better. Like, I've seen you drink and swear and just about fight. So stop it. Say something good. That's an order. Say something good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, hey, uh, I'm just thankful that uh, Steve there had some gaps in his schedule, so now I get him to come out and poison the minds of all my students, uh, which is going to go over so well with the uh, the retirement home out there. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you guys aren't familiar with Firearms Academy of Seattle, it, it, it's been a program that's been around for a long time. You know, Marty's done a great job with the place over the years. Bell and her crew have done a great job up there. Um, and like a lot of places, unfortunately, there's a stagnant point. Yes. Where things are dogmatic. Mm-hmm. And that needs to change if you're going to survive in this industry. Like this industry is a big, giant chess game. Mm-hmm. That's a reason I've been here for 20 some years and I've survived it. It is a chess game. And to keep students and to bring in new students and newer students, you have to progress with what the times are dictating. If that was the case, we'd still be shooting flintlocks. You know, let's be real about this. You have to adapt to the current things. And again, fundamentals are fundamentals. That's it. There's only fundamentals, but there's other ways. You know, there's other things. There's new ways of learning. There's new ways of presenting the information. There's new ways of getting it across to people. And you have to. You just can't live in a world of a stagnant point of view on things. I mean, let's be real. Uh, you know, how long has Moss been teaching his program? 25, 30 years. How, how, how many times have you guys taken it in the panel? Who's taken it multiple times? Mag 20, 40, 50, whatever. I'm actually yeah. taking it for the first time. but <laughs> I help on the range for it, so I've been through it multiple times. It's the same. It doesn't deviate. Well, and I like, mean, really, like guys, this is this is what I like so much about Steve as somebody who is newer coming into the industry as an instructor. Because for me to say things need to change to the old crew, they're going, yeah, you know, you dumb new chick doesn't know what she's talking about, wants to change stuff, you know, typical new kid on the block. When I have somebody like Steve who's been in that crowd for years, you know, decades now, it gives some validity to what I'm seeing and I'm trying to get across. It makes me feel like I'm on the right track and it it adds some weight to what I'm trying to say because the end goal is the same. We want the students in the classes. We want the people more proficient that are walking around in our world with guns. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, it's 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 not a dig. It's it, it's not a slam on Moss or these guys. These guys. It's just an example because he's been around a long time. Clint Smith. You know, all these guys have been around for literally half a century of teaching. You know, they've been around for 40, 50 years of this. These are guys that I went to in my early life. You know, these are all people that I learned from. But when people can go back to the same programs over and over again, and they can basically shoot the drills and exercise in their sleep, they're like a dressage horse. You can do the same program without a rider dictating it. You know it. It's patterned. So I will. And this is the thing. But no, it just things need to change. You know, I go to three, four classes a year. One to get off the line and be on the front of the line and shoot the gun. Uh, but I, I go to three, four classes a year, and I look at new ways, new things. I look for presentation of material more than I do material because 
shooting a gun is shooting a gun. But I look for material the way an instructor handles a problem or the way an instructor puts the information out to a student who's having difficulties, how they bring that person around, how they get them up to a 50% level of the rest of the class. That's what I go to class for. I go to learn how the instructors are dealing with certain things. That's why I go. Yep. So what I was going to say when I interrupted you was Andy and I had the, um, the excellent opportunity to go train with Clint Smith um, mm -hmm. just a year or two ago. And one of the, one of the things that we all noticed was it was a private uh, tutorial for urban rifle and pistol. And mm -hmm. we spent three days at Thunder Ranch with uh, Tim Knight, Chewy, Andy, and myself. And the one thing that we noticed was when Clint realized that his entire student base, which was just four of us, we were all instructors. He immediately shifted the class from, you know, I'm teaching a student to I'm teaching an instructor how to teach a student. And it absolutely amazed us. And he, he took us back to how to teach the fundamentals, because like you said, Steve, shooting a gun is shooting a gun. I don't need to learn how to shoot a rifle. I need to learn how to teach somebody how to shoot a rifle. And that's exactly what he did. So he's, you know, Clint is definitely one of my, you know, aha, you know, instructors. I mean, it, it, it really made a huge difference in my instruction, at least. And I'm hoping Andy and Tim and Chewy's as well. Here's what I tell guys that are budding instructors or teachers, whatever it is, because most are just instructors. They just instruct certain things. They don't really, some do teach people, others are just instructors, depending on your playbook and how you look at things. A mark of a good educator is a reading the class, knowing when and where to push the class, how to flip the class. Okay, and by flipping the class, I mean weather delays. Okay, so what are you gonna do now? I've got two hours of tornadoes and storms going on. What is your material for that? What do you do when you get students in the classroom now and they're sitting around on a three and a half hour lunch break? You know, basically is what it boils down to. What do you have in your bag of tricks that you can do that at this range or this particular range or whatever it is based on these conditions? So it's it's how you can, a you know, teach the students, teach the instructors that are in the course, give them information. What is your fall weather plan that you can flip this when you have downtime? Or when the weather becomes so unbearable because of the heat, like this year, I was teaching in 115 degree weather. I could only do so much with the students in certain hours of the day. So I had to completely flip schedules, reverse schedule, early schedule stuff. You, you have to be able to flow that in the mark of a good facilitator, a good educator, instructor, coach, whatever, is their ability to take the worst and turn it into the best learning points possible. Um, I had that last year in Amarillo. Um, <laughs> horrible weather, March or this year. God, was it March this year? Holy shit. Um, it was, and that's how many classes I've done. It's losing my mind, but it turned into an ice storm. And then it turned, we couldn't shoot indoors on the indoor range they had because it was only rated for 22s. And it was a low light pistol class. It couldn't take guys out in the dark because it was negative fucking 10 degrees. And none of these guys had clothing for this weather. I turned the entire low light pistol program into a dry program indoors with nothing but manipulations, mag changes, and lighting techniques. Nice. The dudes were like, we learned more in this than we did actually firing rounds on the range because recoil is recoil. If you know how to manage it, you know how to manage it. Techniques are important, not tactics, but techniques right. to help that along. So for me, when I look at that, that's one of the things I look at. What is the instructor's backup plans on things when things go to shit? Agreed. And also their med plans, their medical plan is huge to me as well, because I'm a big med guy. So that's another one to me. It's not just this, this is an IFAC. <sighs> that's cool. I'm glad your tourniquet's still in the wrapper, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Sterile. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, I go through my med kit on the range of the students. I tell them exactly what's going to happen because I've seen people shot on the range. I've dealt with it. I've dealt with it on multiple levels, you know, and I go through the med kit. I go through the med plan. I go through my bag. I go through the entire emergency procedures. I go through how it's going to happen when you shoot yourself or if somebody does shoot themselves on a range. And it happens. But just because something dangerous doesn't mean it has to be, right? That's the best thing that Ken Hackathorn ever told me. Just because something is dangerous doesn't mean it has to be. And so when, when I look at that, I, I, I want to see their med plans. I want to see their med brief, how they designate their equipment on the range for low light, all these things. I look at all the nitty details. That's what separates to me. 
I like it. Jeremy, anything? Oh, I'm sorry, Andy, anything to add? No, I'm good, man. This is a this is a this is all good information. I really like it. I enjoy it. And you know, let me let me tell you so a little bit of a little bit of a good. So you know, Clint Smith. Yeah, I loved it. Been to Dave Spaulding, going to Masad with Jeremy here in a couple weeks. Um, Love you know, Dave. to be completely honest, you know, uh, Steve, I haven't got to train with you yet, but I'd love to one day. Man, my 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 guys right here on this podcast. Uh, I can't tell you how much Tim has helped me with my shooting. I'm actually going shooting with him tomorrow night. I hope, hopefully, we get there. Yep. But um, you know, uh, we talked about this in the pre-meeting. <laughs> Don't tell me that. I know which range you guys are using. <laughs> we're, we're moving now. Yeah, but um, you know, we talked about this in the beginning about for us, we're in New Mexico, and the the training, it's training's not very much here. Lot, we're in. Are the, you kidding? Have you been to Albuquerque on a weekend? Uh, we live. We live here. <laughs> yeah, we get real life training just by driving to the gas station. What do you mean your defensive handgun course is in the Walmart parking lot? <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, we we have a, I have a Tim Heron right here, right down the street from me. So Tim Heron Shooting dot com. Uh, training him. Training him. <laughs> he fits for sure over here. <laughs> One day I'll just train with him. I'm moving to Albuquerque. I'll fix you all. Please do. Oh. I'll take all of Tim's students. Tim will have to work for me. <laughs> oh. Hey, as long as you pay yeah. mediocre, I'm good. <laughs> all right. Daily rate, bro. He <laughs> might actually, after being a full time instructor for a while, Tim, you probably welcome that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, until you're paying out $45,000 a year in taxes, get back to me. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Not I'm not good at math, but sixty five <sighs> a year might be might be what we need to do, Andy. <laughs> so Tim, what are your final thoughts for our, our listeners? Um go take a Sentinel Concepts class, period. Mm. So and this is coming from a guy that makes his living <laughs> teaching teaching shooting as well. Um, take a class with Steve. Um, and I, I say that not only as a peer, but as a friend, um, um, Steve has helped me to develop my business and my business model. Um, he helped me make connections in, within the industry, um, that I, uh, I'll be forever in his debt with. Um, when I say honestly that Steve and I talk almost daily, I'm not lying. Um, whether it be text messages or phone calls, um, I look forward to every conversation I have with the guy. We bounce ideas off each other. No, no. <laughs> we bounce ideas off each other. He is, he's seriously, he's my go-to when I've got something that I want to test or theorize or convey information to somebody that. <laughs> <laughs> that so those you know, of you I, are listening, they're calling each other right now. That, that I want to bounce ideas off of. I mean, I, I, I don't just do that with anybody and I respect his input. I respect his answers. And I know he's always going to shoot me straight, whether we're talking about tax shit for businesses, whether we're talking about travel expenses, whether we're talking about how to get here, how to get there, how to handle students, how to handle class structures. I mean, uh, I can't say enough good about Steve. And honestly, uh, I want to put Steve on my calendar for next year for 2020. And I know we said this, <laughs> I said this all year this year, and unfortunately we just could right. not make schedules yeah. match to uh, to either for him to come to one of my classes or for me to get into one of his classes. But I, uh, mark my words, I'm saying this right now, I will make something happen in 2020 to get my ass to one of Steve's pistol classes. Yeah, I want the same thing. And same. I will leave our listeners with this. It's just a simple two words. Do work. Do work. Good stuff. If you guys ever want to uh, create a class that you can have for instructor taxes, I'll take that class too. Yeah. Write it all off. Hey, hey, Write get it all a good Jewish the accountant. Sort it out. <laughs> get a Jewish accountant. That's all I'm going to tell you right now. Um, get, get, a, get a good, get a good one, man, because it's, it's it's real. It's, it's yeah. you know, there, it's kind words. Nice. You know, I've been uh, I know working on Steve for, for a while. Um, you know, the, I have a list of instructors that I want to train with. Um, and it, it, the more 
I guess the more top level instructors that I talk to uh, through this or other students, um, I guess the shorter that list gets. Um, and, and, you know, and Steve's kind of stated near the top of that list, uh, if not at the top of that list. Um, a firearms instructor, um, you know, I think it, the easiest thing that a firearms instructor could do is, is create a class that that'll make people feel good about themselves and, and, and convince them that they got a little bit better. But everything that I've seen, um, you know, through after actions of uh, students of Steve's and and what he puts out, um, it's not a he's not a bullshit instructor. Um, and, you know, I've, I've trained with some bullshit instructors and um, they make you feel good. But Especially then you're, you're thinking about it a week later. Especially that uh, Tim Heron guy. He yeah. Yeah, he's shitty. He's <laughs> <laughs> the shittiest shaved. He's so bad he cut my stage time in half. All right. Um, but you, you think about it a week later and you're like, what did that do for me? Um, so I, I can't express that enough. If you guys are looking to spend some training dollars somewhere, um, get on sentinelconcepts.com, check out his calendar. Um, I don't know if you guys are good at math, but if he's teaching 60 weekends a year or 60 classes a year, that's that's a shitload of classes. Um, and he's probably not too far of a drive from you. Um, you know, so if, I think if there's any reputable instructor within a six hour drive from where you're at, um, stop making excuses and, and uh, pony up the dollars. Agreed. Um, if, if you need to take out a credit card and that's your training credit card, right? You take a class a year, you pay it off. You take a class next year, you pay it off. Um, and, and, and get out there and, and make yourself better. Um, we appreciate everybody jumping on. My segues are terrible. Um, but uh, I want to thank you guys for keeping this the safest podcast on the internet. We are 39 episodes in, zero desk pops or negligent discharge. Uh, yeah. so we appreciate you guys keeping that straight. I can going fix forward. that. Hold on, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you've got it made, right? You know, you, you've got it made when the world famous Joe Chambers walks into your hotel room and hands you a bourbon. <laughs> that, 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 that's how good it is, right? This is how you know you reach the pinnacle of your career. It's like Joe Chambers just walks in and hands you a bourbon. <laughs> hey, Joe. I'm like, like, yeah, right? I'm like, how good is that? I'm like, yeah, baller status achieved, bitches. <laughs> well, I'm glad the After Action Project can make that happen for you. Just, uh, we'll, we're gonna, I'm going to put that in our show notes and our emails to instructors uh, that we made that happen tonight. Yeah. Um, no, I, I appreciate you guys and I appreciate everything. Um, as always, you know, there's no magic in this. There's a lot of good people out there. My, my list of guys is very short and gals that I will train with and teach with. Um, I've been lucky enough over the years to have those people in my life. Um, and there's a lot of good people out there. You know, there really is. There's a lot of shitheads out there. Um, find a discipline you're interested in. Go shoot it. You know, go shoot matches when you're done with whatever tactical class, shooting class, pulls like course, whatever. Go shoot them. Have fun. Go have fun with the guns. Go learn to shoot the guns well. Invest some time in it. It's only shooting, man. It can only make you better. And and that's it. It really is. Uh, you, you know, same thing with Tim. This year, I'm going to get into something with Tim, regardless of the fact that it's just me and Tim going to the range and shooting. I don't care. Um, but get out and do it. You, you know, look for instructors that are going out and working with other instructors. That's important. And that's the only way they are going to push their programs and get beyond a stagnant point of puppy mills. And that's what a lot of dudes are in this industry. They're puppy mills and they're parroters. Um, and they're showmen. It's what they really are. And I, I, I lived that life. I know it. I, I was in that era during that years of mag, right? I went in there late 29, 2009 through 14, man. 13, when we closed it to 14. I, I lived the entertainment. While there was validity to a lot, lot of things, it was sexy. It brought training back wholesale and mainstay to people. But get out there and find stuff. Find somebody in your area. Go out, seek out a, a good master class or, or grandmaster class, USBSA shooter from your local clubs. Go train with them. Go learn from those guys. You will come away better. Go find some IDPA guru somewhere and do the work. You know, they're everywhere. You can find somebody to learn something from. And that's all I'm going to say because I'm tired of you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, your damn three per and your damn three percent or punisher skull tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bourbon and join you. Yeah. I was talking about bells, not you guys. 
<laughs> yeah, where can we join up the three per movement? Bill, you mind letting us know? Oh, <laughs> come on now. She's from Idaho. They've got that down to a science. Oh, geez. <laughs> she has a cardboard license plate. And she's got the little card she hangs up in the window. I don't consent to your non constitutional federation. With those no, I do drive a big old okay. rusted Ford Highboy, though. Nice. <laughs> and it's a oh. manual. Oh, yeah. Ooh, it's pretty badass. They still make those? Not the car, but people that can drive them? Yeah, yeah no. No, they don't. Yeah, she can. <laughs> but anyway, I, I appreciate it, guys. I'm going to go get yeah, this thanks, done. But I, if awesome. we ever do this again, man, please, I'd be more than happy to come back and hang out with you guys. It was awesome. Awesome. Thanks. You guys See very you. much. See you great. Time. Thank Take you, guys. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys. She's straight. Bye. No, she didn't. <laughs>